you so much. I'd like for you this morning to turn to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 3. John is uh, very kind to us in two of his books, and he gives us the exact explanation for why he has written those particular books. The uh, book of John, the Gospel of John, of course, is one, and this is another one. Uh, chapter 5 and verse 13, which is not our text, uh, says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So, the purpose of John writing this book is to explain to us how we can know that we have eternal life. Uh, there are five uh, evidences of spiritual life that John gives to us. We're going to be looking at one found in chapter 3 and verse 14. But let's back up and begin with verse 12. Not as Cain, who was that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Let us pray. Lord, as we spend a few minutes looking into your word this morning, I pray that thy Holy Spirit would guide us. May we receive the blessing, the instruction, the conviction, whatever it is that you have for each one of us respectively. And I pray that you might be glorified, not only through what is said here this morning, but also in the response of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. In verse 13, the apostle writes, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. The word, the expression here, marvel not, uh, in the tense means to stop a continued response. And I think God is gracious in allowing us, and in fact, I think that many times he's gracious in, uh, in the recognition that initially we may not do well. And people who don't, do not do well are human beings. And Christians, believers, true believers, are human beings. The problem is, is when we continue in a course of behavior which is prohibited. So he's, the idea is don't keep doing this particular thing. Don't keep marveling, being surprised, being shocked that the world hates us. Now why does the world hate us? Well, in reality, we're the innocent objects of unprovoked hatred. In other words, essentially, in a, in a sense, there's no reason. Now, I recognize that in verse 12, it says the last part, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. But can someone explain to me the rationale of that? They just hate us. We'll talk a little bit more exactly why. What have we done to cause them to hate us? Uh, someone has said that uh, in many cases, being a Christian is doing good and receiving evil. Uh, that doesn't sound very optimistic, does it? But God gives us grace and he enables us. Uh, as we see in verse 12, this whole idea of hating righteous people is of long standing. We don't really know how long man was on the earth before uh, Cain killed Abel, but that's pretty early. That is very early, and so and it's continued right to this present time and will continue until the end of the age. Uh, in John 15, Jesus said, they hate, they hate me, they'll hate you. Why? Same reason. What did Jesus do that was so horrible? What did he do that would cause him to hate them? You see, they hate righteous. They, they hate the righteous and they hate righteousness. And so... They hated Jesus, they hate us. And we're not to be surprised. I think it's in their spiritual DNA. 
John 8, 44 says, Ye are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He is a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh his own, for he is the father of it. A liar and the father. Ye are of your father the devil. Now, I remember being told all my life that this means that, that Satan is our spiritual father. I'm not so sure about that. I believe that this is probably Hebrewism, which means you're just like your dad. You're just like the... You're just, like the You're just like the devil. Now, who was Jesus talking to? Was he talking to the down and outers, the, uh, the, the skeptics, the, 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 the awful people? He was speaking to the religious leaders. He said, ye are just like your father. You're just like the devil. The father of the son of the father of is, or the son of implies that they, there is a very real relationship between how they act. And so it's in their spiritual DNA. I think it's safe to say that whatever God loves, the devil hates, and whatever God the devil, whatever God hates, the devil loves. He's on the opposite side. So we we've talked about this to give us the perspective for for what the Lord for what John is about to say next. Now let's let's back up for a moment. And recognize that we are in a world that is no, as the song says, is no friend of grace to help us unto God. The world hates us. So what do we need? Well, among the things we need is a refuge. And that is what the idea is found in verse 14. For we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. You see... We come together, and that's one of the reasons that this time when we have not been able to come together has been so difficult. And I don't, I don't think we realize how difficult it would be. We, we didn't realize in the beginning how difficult it would be. Because, I mean, I come to church whenever I get a chance. And I think most, most, really, most believers who really love the, the brethren and want to be with them do the same thing. It's a refuge. Now, this is proof that we love, the fact that we love the brethren is proof, proof of our salvation. We know that we have passed from death unto life. Why? For what reason? What's the evidence? Because we love the brethren. The word know, we know, is the, the, the pronoun is emphatic. Now, let me explain. Normally speaking, in Koine Greek, Greek, which is the, the language that the New Testament is written in, the pronoun is contained in the verb. For example, therapeuo, great, great group word, it's the Greek word we get the word therapy from, and the word means I heal. So the pronoun is contained in the verb. However, if they would like to make the pronoun emphatic, they use the pronoun and then the verb that contains the pronoun. And that's what is found here. We know. We know. We have certain knowledge. You know, Jesus said, I am come that they might have that you might have peace I leave with you. My peace give I unto you. Not, not as the world give, you, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, folks, those, there are those out there that tell us you can never know if you have eternal life. Well, we've already quoted to you a verse that says we can know. But why? Because you see, the Bible says perfect love casteth out fear. And if we cannot know that we have eternal life, how can we have God's peace? The most important, the most critical need that a person has is to have eternal life. But what it, It's great to have eternal life, but there's no peace in it unless we know we have eternal life. So we have this certain knowledge. And this is the description of one aspect of salvation. And that is it, this, this that we have passed from death unto life. Now the very moment you get saved, a whole slew of things happen. You're justified, you're reconciled, and, and uh, you, are, uh, you are become a 
an heir and joint heir with Jesus Christ. And there are other things too. But one of the things that happens is that we are passed from the realm of death into the realm of life. Now, what is this realm of death? Well, there are a number of aspects to it. First of all, we're busy dying. I don't know how long you're going to live. I just heard just uh, several hours ago about a man that wasn't that old died. Went to the doc. I went to the the mercy room because he didn't feel well. Had some procedures done. Died. We don't know how long we're going to live. You know, you and I all have a rendezvous with death, and only those who were raptured will escape that. But there's the spiritual death. We are dead spiritually. That means that that spiritual part of us is not operative. And then there's another kind of death spoken of in Revelation chapter 20, uh, verses 11 through 15, where it talks about the great white throne, is that those that are not, whose names are not found written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So at the moment of salvation, at the very instant, we are passed from all of this into the realm of life. Now, what is the realm of life? Well, yes, we will die. But as, Je as Jesus explained, we shall also be resurrected. Our death should not hold fear. Now, I can quite understand that the, the, the method that gets us out of this physical life takes our life, takes our breath, stops our heart beating, can be a traumatic thing. Death itself, we should not fear. So what, what, is, what is this life? Well, first of all, we have life eternal. Uh, we are living, we are on the mortal end of eternal life. I'm not going to receive, you are not going to receive, if you're a believer, you're not going to receive eternal life. You have it. You are in possession of it. And as the book of Ephesians said, we, we are in the heavenlies. And we will go into all what all that means. And what is the substance of this, this truth? Because we love the brethren. The word love here is in the present tense, which means it is con it's a continuing action. It's the practice of loving. Now, folks, we all know that every one of us, every Christian listening to my voice, every true believer has acted in an unloving fashion. Why? Because we're human beings. But if we have eternal life, then we cannot continue in that practice. When we've looked at the perspective, the perspective is that the world hates us. The proof is, the proof of eternal life is found in the fact that we love the brethren. Now I would like to look at the practice. Why is this important? Because the world hates us. And because the world hates us, we need to have those who love us and whom we love ourselves. It's a haven. A haven of love in the brethren. There's a network of love. You know, a network makes something stronger. It makes it more durable. It makes it more resistant to things that would damage it. We need that network of love. We love the brethren and they love us back. What is the substance of this love of the brethren? What does it mean? To love the brethren, it means not a natural affection that's stimulated by the loveliness of the object of our love. We all know that there are people that are difficult to love. They're obnoxious. They're cranky. They're grouchy. They're picky. They're self-centered. We, we, we could go on and on with that list of defects in their character. And they're not easy to love. I remember when I, we first moved to New York, sometimes hanging on the the, 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 the mirror inside of a car would be a, a little sign that says to know me is to love me. Fact of the matter is, folks, the more the better you know somebody, the less there is to love. Maybe that doesn't sound some, like something that you would appreciate, but I think it's true. 
if we could really know someone, it would not be a pretty picture. Now, I say that because I don't really want you to really, really know me either. Why? Because what's in there is not always lovable. So it's not a natural affection stimulated by the loveliness of the one to love, but it's an ethical love which consistently seeks the true welfare of the person that is loved. What's our definition? The sustained direction of one's will toward another's good. The sustained direction. Oh yes, there are times when we are not loving, but it does not continue. Why? Because we have been passed from death unto life. We've been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. We have been changed. We, we, the, the, the Holy Spirit is urging us to love even those who are not necessarily easy to love. Do we like, do you like every Christian brother, every Christian sister? You know, I uh, spent 13 years in Christian schools. Four in elementary, and one in, oh, three in elementary, one in junior high school, then one, another one in junior high school, and four in high school, four in college. And I was around a lot of believers, and you know something? Some of them are obnoxious. And there were some that I didn't particularly like. I mean, you know, they were not the person that if I had to choose somebody to spend two years on a desert island, they wouldn't, I wouldn't, they wouldn't have been in the short list. All right? In fact, they would have been on the other end. They would have been in the short list of the ones I wouldn't want to spend that two years with. So we don't have to like them in the sense that we like all of their habits. I was reading a, a book in the fellow... Uh, the author said when he was in seminary, his roommate was extremely obnoxious. He, he didn't sing all day. And then about 11 o'clock at night, he'd pull out, he'd just start singing away. While, while the, the, the fellow was trying, his, his roommate was trying to sleep. And, and, and he was, this guy was just full of all kinds of obnoxious, obnoxious things. But he said, you know, I loved him. And I found out later he loved me. Had a funny way of showing it, but nevertheless it's true. Well, what does it mean to love the brethren? Well, at least this much I think is true. We, lead, we love to be with God's people. And part of that is God has put a bond between our hearts and theirs. My wife and I like to go camping. And we have a particular place we go. Huh, I guess you could say we're kind of in a rut. And uh, we, we, were, we pulled into the campground and it couldn't go directly to our site. You had to go way around. And when we went around the loop, we passed the bathroom, you know, where the, uh, the toilets, the showers and all that, the sinks to, to, to wash your dishes and whatnot. And uh, as we were going along, we, when we camp, we like to people watch. And so we passed this, and you're going very slow, about five miles an hour. So we passed this guy that's big portly gentleman, uh, older, he, he was probably about my age back then, and he was uh, working, he was uh, setting up his tent, and I said to my wife, you know why he's so close? He's, he's probably going to have to go to the bathroom at night, or maybe he's set up right here because his wife's going to have to go to the bathroom at night. And uh, so we drove, we set up, and, we came, and I come, came back there to do something, and I usually get kind of loquacious when we camp, and so I start speaking to the gentleman, and the, the strangest thing was, when I saw him, I said, you know, this guy looks like an Episcopal priest. Now you say, how, how in the world would, what does an Episcopal priest look like? I don't know, but I thought he did. And so we started talking, and lo and behold, he had once been an Episcopal priest. And uh, what was interesting is he had left, left the Episcopal church because of their apostasy. As a teenager on a merchant marine ship, he had gotten saved reading his Bible. And you know what? He still had some Episcopalian ideas. For example, he believed in the, uh, the literal presence of the body and the blood of Christ in communion. Uh, 
he probably didn't believe in a baptism by immersion and a number of things that I believe. I, th I think he probably believed you could lose your salvation. Not sure, but you know what? There was a bond there. We fellowshipped. Now, I'm a Baptist. I'm unabashedly a Baptist. And he was uh, kind of Episcop like Episcopalian-like. And yet we had fellowship. Why? It wasn't... Uh, it was it was in spite of our differences because there was there was something there we love the brethren. I was reading a book several months ago by Harry Ironside. Harry Ironside died in 1951. Very interesting uh, man, uh, mostly a Bible conference speaker, and this was way back when you didn't take planes very often. Uh, if you went from one place to another, you took a train. And so he was on the train. He, he was going across uh, quite a number of miles. Uh, over, it took, I think it was across the entire country. And so he was on that there several days, and he had the, the, the places that you sleep. And uh, he was, uh, had his feet out in the aisle, and he was reading his Bible one day, and this woman walked by and said, what, what you reading? She says with a really heavy, it was a German accent. And he said, reading my Bible. She says, oh, oh, yeah, hang on, I'm going to go get my Bible. So she goes and she gets her Bible. She sits there and so they're, they're reading verses about it. And somebody else comes along and says, what, 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 are, you, uh, what are you doing? Oh, we're reading the Bible. Oh, let me go get mine. And so they, and pretty soon he had a whole group of people sitting around. And for every day they would, they would have a little, little Bible conference. They, some, some of them read their, their Bibles in a different language. They, uh, they weren't all the same denomination, but what, there was that bond of fellowship. We love the brethren. We can't help it. And when it says here, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren, that's not, that's no, uh, that's, we don't get to pat ourselves on the shoulder because of that. That's not something great. That is something that is in our, is in our spiritual DNA. We love God's people. Now on occasion, we get upset with a brother or sister. But that doesn't change the principle. The love here, the verb, is continuing. Okay, so we have some bumpy roads, but then we make, we make things right and we go back to loving that person again. Now what is, but there's a problem. The problem comes with, with the intersection of of self-love with the need to love others. When these two come together, when my self-love meets the need, comes together, comes to the point at which I need to love someone else. In other words, my selfishness. Now, there are a number of aspects to love. There's kindness. Are we being kind? There's gentleness. You know, some people are really good at these things. Some others, it's a little harder. Generosity. You know, I've heard the idea that person gets saved and their wallet gets saved. If their wallet doesn't get saved, then they don't give like they should. Generous. Generosity. Now, I have limited means. You have limited means. I don't care. How, unless you're somebody like uh, Warren Buffett or Bill Gates has got more money than you could spend in a, in a, a hundred lifetimes. You you have limited, we have limited means. And so when I give to this person, I have an essence taken from my own self. And the closer uh, our income, our, our situation is to subsistence, the harder it is to give. Remember, Jesus talked about the widow who gave the, the two mites. What was going on there? She gave all she had. She really needed that money, but she gave it nevertheless. Sacrifice. And the Lord Jesus is our example. Verse 16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God 
because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You know, if you're willing to lay your life down for somebody, then a few bucks is not a problem. But you know, the, 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 the difficulty arises in this. Laying down your life is theory. Giving is fact. Not only is the giving an imposition in some cases, it's a sacrifice, but the kindness can be. The gentleness, the general, uh, the uh, sacrifice is the essence of love. In verse 14, in the last part, it gives us the opposite. is proof of the lack of spiritual life. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Abideth in death. That's his abode. That's where he lives. That's where he's in danger. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. Two things here. Can you honestly say you love the brethren? Do you love to be with God's people? Are they, are they your crowd? Is that where you feel comfortable? Do you desire to come to church in some measure because you want to be with God's people? If not, if that present evidence is not there, you do not have eternal life. And I say that on the basis of God's word. And how are you, if you are truly a believer and you love the brethren, how are you demonstrating that? Is it ever costing you anything? True love will cost. It will cost. The Lord Jesus loved us and he gave his life for us. Is there evidence in your life of your love for the brethren, may it be. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that that love was demonstrated at Calvary. But Lord, we also thank you that it is demonstrated every moment of every day that we live and that one day it will be shown to us without measure in thy presence. Lord, help us to demonstrate to the brethren our love for them in kindness and gentleness and generosity and sacrifice, whatever might be called for in that particular instance. In Jesus' name, amen.